the summary statement is there's no single explanation for the physician's behaviors, okay? So I'm gonna talk about some of the motivators for it, but we can't just come away with one simple answer. And I wanna emphasize what Tessa says, which is that we're all capable of doing this. And so when I approached this lecture, it was from a context of what if I lived in Germany at this time, would I also be vulnerable to that? And so instead of defining them as other or as an aberration, or is that just something that the other people did, I think would be doing a disservice for how we can learn this information today. Okay, so before World War II, Germany was a revered location for medical education and research training. Research er experimentation was highly valued, and ambitious physicians from all over the world traveled to German laboratories and clinical facilities to learn what was the most up-to-date information, including from my institution, Dr. Michael DeBakey, the renowned uh, surgeon. Before World War II, Germany had more Nobel laureates than any other country. And as Atessa mentioned, it, as early as 1900, it was an early adopter of research ethics and provided guidance on research practices which explicitly forbade research on children and other vulnerable populations. And not only in 1931, they had the regulations on new therapy and human uh, experimentation, which were stricter than the Nuremberg Code that came out of the doctor's trial. So what happened? During the Weimar Republic, nearly 50% of German physicians became early joiners of the Nazi party. This is a greater percentage enrollment than for any other profession. Similarly, a great number of early Nazi joiners were medical students. In contrast, Jewish physicians were characterized as unethical, they were ostracized by their colleagues, and Jewish physicians were eventually prohibited from practicing medicine except on their Jewish patients. I would like to emphasize this image, which is an artist by the name of Ari Galles. And Galley's intention was to depict from this image how the original Hippocratic Oath was trapped behind the images of concentration camp uniforms or perhaps images of prison bars. And he used charcoal ash to create this image and this reflects crematorium ashes. In post-war interviews, physicians, Nazi physicians stated that their oath of loyalty to Hitler, which they took as SS military officers, was more real to them than a vague ritual that they performed at medical student graduation. And even though we've all been talking about the Hippocratic Oath, the Hippocratic Oath was originally created in ancient Greece because the society of ancient Greece did not trust the physicians at that time. So they came up with this oath as a way to have an antidote to the distrust that society had of their physicians. Okay. Okay, so these images are showing where research experimentation occurred. And it wasn't just in the concentration camp. That wasn't the only location of where doctors had aberrant behaviors. OK, so the next slide is to summarize key examples of external behaviors that doctors had that were easily observed. And they reflect how medicine became political, politicized. So Robert J. Lifton's book, included, he was an American psychiatrist who interviewed uh, the physicians after the war, and this was the first in-depth study of how medical professionals rationalized their behavior in the Holocaust. So for example, physicians assisted in writing the legislation. It wasn't just that they followed the legislation, they helped write it. And this legislation permitted sterilization of medically defined members of society. They also not only wrote the legislation, but they reported those individuals with disability, and this was disguised as public health. In a medical capacity, they served on hereditary health courts, and they used scientific criteria 
that would legally permit sterilization. None of this was done without examining the individuals. And not only did they stigmatize their Jewish colleagues, but they prevented enrollment of Jewish students into medical schools as early as 1938. And by 1938, later that year, they revoked the licenses of practicing physicians and they renamed them as providers. There were very limited protests against these processes. I can give an example of the White Rose, which was a nonviolent resistance group, and those individuals ended up being killed. Physicians also taught racial hygiene courses based on uh, the teachings of leaders in the field. And as Tessa Shalosh described, mandatory lectures were part of the medical curriculum beginning in 1939. The ethical and training included the unequal worth of human beings and the authoritarian role of the physician. And they described the moral imperative to preserve the purity of Aryan people. Furthermore, they performed eugenic sterilizations, which affected almost 1% of the population. Okay, so these external behaviors became more atrocious as the political system itself became medicalized. For example, physicians then were responsible for naming the candidates for euthanasias, and they would put a plus or a minus sign on the paperwork to determine who was a candidate for euthanasia. Again, this did not include a direct physical examination. Physicians were responsible for overseeing the transfer of patients to these specialized centers where the euthanasia would occur. And if they had prior experience, they ended up becoming commanders of a concentration camp. The physicians themselves performed the lethal injections. They oversaw the systemic starvation of patients, and they managed the gas chambers. They also coordinated the processes for requesting autopsy specimens and falsifying every death certificate. And this is separate from the selection process that we're all aware of. And this is separate from the research uh, processes that occurred in the death camps, the hospitals, and universities. OK, so you've seen this slide. But what I think is important, if you look at the top left-hand corner, you see this is Adolf Hitler's stationery. It's his personal stationery. So it didn't have to be a law. OK, that, but his word became law. And so people, this gave cover to the doctors for their behavior. But what is one of the historians is talking about, even though this had Adolf Hitler's signature, they think that the draft of this correspondence was actually written by a physician, Dr. Max Dacrinus. And this became a mechanism with physician support to link the euthanasia program now with the war effort, which was politicized. And this was an attempt to minimize a physician's reticence to participating in the program. Okay, so here's an example of a physician, and this is uh, Dr. Victor Brack. Here he is at the Nuremberg trial, and they would argue about which mechanism of euthanasia was the best. So Dr. Victor Brack said the syringe belongs in the hands of the physician, and Carl Brandt was saying, no, maybe we need to do the gassing. Only doctors should carry out the gassing, and the way to show that Adolf Hitler was ethical when Brack and Brandt were talking with Hitler, Hitler said, well, which way is the most humane way? So this was the historical pr precedence for this. OK, so now I want to talk about internal physician behavior. So we talked about what everyone could observe, but what was going on internally, psychologically for the doctors? And we've been trying to understand how physicians who were supposed to uphold the Hippocratic Oath actually justified their behaviors. How did they rationalize it? And how did they cope with these behaviors that they were doing? And so one of the things that when we interview these individuals, they describe their sense of duty, not only as members of the military, but as members of the Nazi party and as members of society. So for example, if a soldier can convince himself that the enemy is the embodiment of evil, that soldier can then maintain the perspective that murder is in the service of an altruistic and worthy cause. So the soldier has what was called a killing self, 
that's created on a behalf of a transcendent cause. So this is an internal behavior. One of the things that they talk about is how we split, and this is considered a subconscious behavior, and it's how one avoids an internal conflict, especially if there's a moral conflict about the consequences of one's behavior. Medical physicians were attracted to Nazism because it was a way of alleviating a sense of powerlessness that was prevalent between World War I and World War II. And if you joined the Nazi party early, this became a mechanism for upward mobility and financial security. And that the other thing that other historians talk about is that some of these physicians actually were doctors during World War I and that they were scarred because they saw how much disease and death and that made them more maybe amenable to understanding that Nazism could be a way to control that. And the other thing that Lifton talks about, he says that the, when he was interviewing physicians at Auschwitz, they talked about, you know, it was difficult, but that it was a necessary form of a personal ordeal. And one of the takeaway points from Lifton's book, and even modern day psychiatry emphasizes this, is we all lie to ourselves, okay? And by that lying, we are able to create a foundation of self-deception, not only in our behaviors, but also in how we cope. I mean, just think about a simple thing of people that look like a good husband that, that they're having an affair. They're lying to themselves, okay? Or that people can do research and then accept money on the side or they have a conflict of interest. They divide their good self from the bad self and that they do not let those doors between those two personalities come together. Okay, so... The next slide, again, I'm just showing the splitting, you know, which the heaven and hell approach, is that we want to try and further understand how physicians were able to perform these disparate activities. And one of the things that they lost were their professional boundaries. The physicians were extremely methodical in their activities. They overcame any innate reluctance to participate in this violence, and part of that was the socialization process. There was a subset of physicians that were actually very ambitious and were zealots and were quite ambitious in their actions and enjoyed this work. But the socialization process of medical training and post-career activities also further maintained a sense of normalcy that multiple individuals described a shared sense that Auschwitz was morally separate from the rest of the world. So instead of the doctors acting on a duty to warn, they felt that these individuals were already condemned to death, and because they were condemned to death, there were no behaviors that the individual physician had to experience on their research or clinical activities. So this is what the psychiatrists again define as splitting, which is the ability to harbor contradictory attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors, which allows that individual to maintain a process of denial. Okay, so these effects of these decisions and behaviors were also not truthfully labeled, and they were kept secret, and they had a language that they called their behaviors as a, a mercy killing or as a selection. They didn't call it murder or genocide. And that by, if I would send someone saying that they were being selected, but I did not actually witness the cremation, I could plausibly deny of not knowing what was going to happen. And so I maintained, if I maintain these secrets, it's not just within myself, it's with my colleagues, it's with my family, and these secrets were maintained after the war. So another contrast to this, that some of the physicians said that they were providing islands of humanity, that they were actually doing a lot of good. And because these separate selves did not remain integrated, there was not a moral conflict, and it actually diminished the appearance of individual guilt. OK, so these rationales allowed one to maintain the fiction of a good self. OK, so you can see this. And they, many physicians felt with absolute certainty and convictions that their behaviors were just. 
There was, we talked about the financial motivations, and there is a paradox in this, that because the psychiatrists were so involved in killing some of the people in the institution, they actually were afraid that if they killed all those individuals, there weren't going to be enough patients for future generations to train on and that the field of psychiatry would disappear. Okay. Certainly, we can talk about anti-Semitism and the sense that they wanted to maintain an Aryan race. Um, but there was also a self-centered interest that if they practice in the euthanasia centers, they didn't have to do frontline military duty, which would result in their own death. OK, so Tessa did talk about the utilitarian rationale that they used that permitted the killing. And this was written by Carl Binding, who was a lawyer, and Alfred Hoke, who was a physician. And they published their eugenic ideas um, in their book, Allowing the Destruction of Life Unworthy of Living. And their bottom line is that they used a utilitarian rationale to say that it was permissible to permit killing especially if this killing resulted in other lives being saved. So that became their calculus for an ethical basis. OK. Now, what are some other things? I'm, I'm going to change the argument to ask the question, are physicians potentially predisposed to this behavior? Is there something about us being a doctor that made us predisposed to this political socialization going on. So Dr. Hack, who's a Harvard-trained psychiatrist, argues that physicians may, in fact, be predisposed to these behaviors. And why is that? Because we conform to the majority behaviors. We are trained in a hierarchical system where authority and rank result in legitimate respect and where our obedience to these rules are rewarded. And this happened during the Third Reich. Authority figures with dissenting views were actually excluded. You did not hear the dissenting views. And the scientific theories of eugenics and, and cleansing had a perceived exactitude. It felt like it was something that we could create and it was easily framed. And then what the doctors did is they framed and demonized others as disgusting, dangerous, unclean, or unethical. And when we were able to moralize our sense of disgust, it became easier to extinguish these populations. And as we mentioned early, social order and social unity were more important than an individual's right. And that if we were doing the research, that we were helping society, and when we redefined killing as a form of healing and saving lives who were more important, that provided another justification for these behaviors. I want to, so here, I, I love this image of Gebhardt, who um, people are aware of the work that he did in Ravensburg. So here's a physician wearing a military uniform, which had different layers of power. But the German Medical Society, which existed prior to Hitler, helped reinforce some of these behaviors. And um, the psychiatrist from Harvard describes how the self-righteousness of the physician was disguised as uh, medically ethical, OK? And because the physicians use these utilitarian ethics to rationalize their behaviors, it expanded to the activities of genocide. Michael Groden describes this fragmentation process. And what would happen in these institutions is the labor, the different steps involved in this were divided among many different people so that one individual didn't have the full responsibility. And so if I could limit what my potential role is, that would limit the guilt that I had. And finally, Carl Brandt talked about they were doing this in Hitler's name. And so the physicians who believed in the society more than the individual could display some of their own guilt. All right, so Karl Brandt, who was one of Hitler's physicians, was mentored about how he could serve science. And his duty was saving those that could be uh, valued scientifically. And he even said during the doctor's trial, 
that he did his behaviors because it was based on ethics. He, he didn't feel that he still did anything wrong. And he described this, that this was part of the total character of war, so why am I in trouble for this? And even when he was sentenced to death, he did volunteer to he himself become a research subject, but the military did not um, allow him to be a subject. Okay, so my last perspective on this comes from the work of Michael Groden, who's a psychiatrist and George Annis, an, an attorney. And they both do a lot of work in health law, bioethics, and human rights. And they wanted to talk about what is it about our medical training that would allow us to become a torturer. Okay, so that one of the things that if you're gonna create a torturer, you have to select an individual that obeys authority. And do they have the necessary intellect, physical strength, positive identification with the politics to serve in this role? And then you have to socialize them so that you have initiation rights, isolation, new rules, new values, and you use special language so that the per perpetrator can redisguise what is reality. So it was called purification or treatment or mercy killing, not genocide. And it's also when you have torture, you have to dehumanize and blame the victim. And through this process, that then desensitizes the physician who is the torturer. You have social monitoring, modeling of group violence. You have a routine exposure to violence. You have the practice of controlled violence. These all provide different levels of sensitization. And then you reward obedient behavior. So, why are physicians vulnerable to becoming perpetrators? They describe how medical training forces the process of compartmentalization. And as a personal anecdote, on my very first day of medical school, what did they do the first afternoon? We went to anatomy lab, and we were all handed a scalpel to begin our anatomy training, first, first afternoon of my medical training. And on that first day, eight members of my class dropped out but they had a line of people that were still waiting to be accepted into medical school that replaced these eight individuals that dropped out. Okay, so if we did not have a way of compartmentalize, how could we do things such as surgery? Okay, this is separate than individual physicians maybe having a propensity to sadism or that are voyeuristic, but we are trained that we have to cause pain as a process of healing, okay? And so we have to have an awareness of violence or an ability to create violence. And we have scientific justifications for why we do this violence. Look at how we do amputations or surgery again. But we have to be able to develop a medical detachment. It is part of our socialization process. And we have to rationalize this and have a way of handling the discomfort of this which is separate than whether or not we're narcissists, whether we're paternalistic, or where we are trained to think that we are naturally superior. Okay, so another part of this is what happens in war, that that can be a justification, because society was at war and the military needed this information. And when they said that those individuals were already condemned to death, the research deaths were used to save more worthy lives. The physicians in this process became agnostic. They didn't recognize the suffering in front of them. They were, some physicians were very opportunistic and ambitious because this became part of their degree program. But it wasn't just the physicians. You had the concentration camp administrators and pharmaceutical companies had financial conflicts of interest in this process for the research to occur. And finally, there was no external constraints on this process. Society did not have a way of slowing down the velocity. And there was an inaccessible supply of subjects and an inexhaustible supply of autopsy specimens. So my final slide comes from Dr. Sherwin Newland. And he, this was a quote when he had attended the deadly medicine exhibit that was in Washington, DC in 2004. And he said, to my startled dismay, I found myself understanding why so much of the German medical establishment acted as it did. Newland realized that given the circumstances, he might have done the same. And he said, what we learn from history comes far less than studying the events 
than in the recognition of human motivations and the eternal nature of human frailty. And so in closing, I will ask you how many people in this room have the fortitude or the insight to be a dissident, to be a witness, to be a conscientious objector instead of a bystander or a perpetrator. And, and, and what are the first steps in this process? It's we have to have an awareness of how we respond when we see a moral behavior or when we see medical mistakes or ethical transgression. Is our dissent visible or invisible? How do we limit the dehumanization that occurs when we have to compartmentalize as part of our medical training? And how do we integrate authentic moral behaviors? Because many of us only have borrowed training. You know, it could be our religious upbringing or the socialization, but what are we doing that's authentically ours? And as a final anecdote, I can talk about my experience during the AIDS epidemic. And this is when we barely had AZT. This is before we had medicines. And everyone was really afraid that if you took care of these patients, you were going to die from some horrible, horrible infection. And so there I am working in the trenches, taking care of these people. And I needed to call one of my colleagues for a consultation because I didn't understand that subspecialty. And he was furious. He said, how dare you call me? I will never see any of your patients and never call me again, okay? And he was a dermatologist, okay? Nothing, I mean, he could just look at it, okay? But even then, it was uh, striking to me how people could say no and that they didn't have the moral integrity to see the individual in front of them. So my final anecdote comes from one of my colleagues who is a surgeon, and when she interviews medical students to come into her program. She doesn't ask, you know, what kind of surgery do you want to do or, you know, what's your training? She asks them, what's the most difficult ethical question that you've experienced or have you ever exhibited any unethical behavior and how did you manage that? And through that program, she has created a diversity of residents who are able to be trained within our system at Methodist Hospital. So thank you very much. I appreciate your attention.